so on last class we talked about um, the, the, the whole part of the DFD and you can see that when we create a DFD okay the things that you have to do first is that um, you can see that the set of DFD consists of the first one hang on I just like turn on my iPad first we have to talk about the this one We have to begin with um, the first, the biggest picture, okay, of the DFD. That is context level DFD. And then you have diagram zero. And then you have diagram one of specific process. Or you may have diagram two, if you want to go down into detail of some um, specific process. So um, these are like, all um, diagrams that you need to have. The things that you have to know is that sometimes we may not be able to start context level diagram straight away, okay? My suggestion is that if you start, you start from diagram zero first, okay? You start from diagram zero first, and then you just pick all entity, okay? to be in the context level diagram. Uh -huh. For example, if diagram zero, it exists that you have, let's say five entities. So the things that you have to do is that when you draw diagram zero, oh sorry, when you draw context level diagram, you prepare those five entities all together. Uh -huh. So this is like the way we do. And after that, you just see for diagram zero for these five entities, okay? Where are input? What are input and output? And then you put those input and output, I'm sorry. We put those input and output into your context diagram, into context diagram, something like this. And later on, you develop diagram one, okay? In order to just like expand the view of diagram zero on a specific, um, process uh -huh. and if diagram one is detailed enough you don't need to do diagram two so it is the optional for you guys uh -huh. so this is the way that we normally do okay so after we finish talking about the DFD already I uh have -huh. after we finish talking about the, the um, DFD already the next thing that I'm going to talk about is the next tool that is what we call data dictionary uh -huh. what is data dictionary Actually, we draw, um, after we draw the data, um, data flow diagrams already, we need to create a data dictionary to explain the description of um, each component that we have in the um, data flow diagrams. Uh -huh. So um, we may call it as data repository. Uh -huh. It's a document to keep all the information about your system data. Uh -huh. So when we talk about the data dictionary, it consists of the field it consists of the records. It consists of, let's say, um, variable data type that you have to use. Uh -huh. Sometimes when you have to use or create the data dictionary, um, some team uh -huh, may use um, case tool to help because when you just like use case tool, for example, once you draw the data flow diagrams already, all of the data flow or all of the data store entity, um, you can generate and pop it up as the um, part of the data dictionary. Uh -huh. Otherwise, if you don't use the case tools, the thing that you have to do is that you may have to use like a word processor or you may use a spreadsheet in order to just like create a template first. And then you just copy those templates and put the information of each component of the data into um, those templates. Uh -huh. So um, these are the, um, the way in order to just like record your um, data elements not uh have -huh. for example if you have a look on the right hand side in here it just like lists all the properties of the field that you have for example in this one it is payroll system okay um, the name of the label that might appear on your data flow diagrams the nickname or the alias uh -huh. data type you have uh -huh. default values or it sometimes if you have the masking for example if it is the date 
what type of date that you would like to have. For example, you may have date slash month slash year. Or in some country, you start with month first, followed by date and followed by year. Okay? And year has is just like the two, um, two digits number, something like that. Depends. This is what we call masking. Okay? When you would like to max some values, how it will be displayed on your system, something like that. Um, source, okay. uh, where you can find this, um, this piece of data or this... Um, uh, yeah, this information. Uh, and uh, what are possible values? Okay. Uh, security, who just like keep this one and um, who can access to this data. Uh, or you can may, um, you may be able to add like some more properties of this data as well if you like. These are just like the basic example that you can put it. Uh, so after that, when we talk about the data element that you keep, what can be the data elements? The data elements here, okay, might be the fields, the variable that you use in your um, system. This one is for both users and for programmers because the users will know that who own this piece of data and the programmers will know that, okay, what data type do they have to use? After that, The things that um, you have to just like um, describe in the data elements, uh, source means where can you find this piece of data. For example, you may um, have to use this data element. For example, if you're talking about like a registration system, one example of data element might be like student ID. Okay, student ID. Where can we find the student ID? Okay, for example, student ID. The source of student ID might be, let's say, student records. Student info record. Red report. Registration record. And so on. You have to clarify all of these sources that these um, data elements can be found. Security, how can you protect this one? For example, you may say that it's encrypted or you may just use some hash function in order to just like generate these numbers. For example, if we are talking about like credit card number, the security is that you are protected with CVV in the back of the credit card, something like that. And also it's hash for the last digit. Same as your um, citizen ID card or a passport number. Okay, it, some, um, it uses hash, hash function as well to generate some digits. That means if you just randomly enter somebody's um, passport number or citizen ID number, okay, if you random, you, you, you might see some error most of the time because some digits must be um, hashed by some function before. Uh, then just specify the security or if you have a specific algorithm to control the hash, um, value of um, that data element, you just specify what algorithm that you use, uh, who is responsible user, and what are description and comments. Uh, you just specify that in the data element, um, data dictionary. After that, when we would like to um, document the data flows, if you remember the data flow, okay, class, can you tell me? In data flow diagrams, what symbol that we symbolize data flow have? What symbol that we use to symbolize data flow? Can someone answer me? What symbol that we symbolize the data flow? Within half. Within. Half. What symbol do we use for representing data flow in data flow diagrams? Uh, what's that called? The rectangle? No, sorry. Pi, what is it? Pi. Oh, did you say my name? Yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, is it the arrow? Yes. 
in this arrow within in this arrow นะครับ this is data flow so in here how you document the data flow normally data flow is like something like a record of data นะครับ that we send from one point to another point for example we may say that okay registration record or we may say that okay payments if you say that okay it's the arrow it's the data flow of payment it's not just the money นะครับ it's the payment information normally it might say that okay for the payment of money let's say we may say we may have amount of money we may have like um, the transaction date we may also have like the bank name we may have the check number something like that or transaction number it's not just the amount of money only so in this case how do we gonna document this so that means we are going to document the registration record or the payment information here normally these are attributes of these um, data flows that we should record the first one what is the name of the data flow or what is the label the label of the data flow or name of data flow is here is here registration record payment or whatever the name that appears on the arrow line what is it you just explain it as a description alternate name you have any some um, other alternate name or nickname or not for example some um, in some university they may say that okay registration record of the student may be called as r01 something like that that means registration record so alternate name is just write r01 but data flow name is registration record I have like this origin where from have origin is here you have to specify here the origin of this arrow suppose we say that is from one process process two let's say then you say that okay um, origin is process two and then specify the name of the process destination destination is here I have the arrow head here where is it suppose we say that all oh, we sent to store in the data store uh, data store one okay uh, student database so destination is student database something like this okay record okay do you have the specific name of the record in student database or not suppose we say that oh we have the special name we have um, students which is rec uh, 01 in the database something like that you just specify but if it's just the name registration record or register record you just specify it as a, uh, what is the record name volume and frequency approximately how many how many registration record do we have for example if we say that we have around um, 3,000 per trimester during registration period okay 2,000 per trimester during add and drop period so you just specify like this and frequency we may say that okay um, three uh, sorry three times per trimester when the system allow the student to register and add and drop something like that you just specify normally in this one for volume and frequency it's just like um, telling the users or telling the person who read this document that it is um, frequency of having this um, data flow to be created okay and um, volume might be just like you may say that in total we have around like um, let's say five uh, fifth, um, sorry five hundred thousand records approximately in the database something like that if you don't know 
you don't guess okay you just leave it as blank okay so because when other people have some problems they will ask you later but if you guess and it's wrong that is not good way to do so so this is to document the data flow you need to have like the attribute of the data flow to be like this and if you ask me that what is the layout of the document it's up to you um, how, um, how would you like to design for example you may have the design to be like similar to this one okay. you may have the design to be like the table like this I have but if you ask me that, hey, can we just like do it as the infographics? Normally, we don't do that in infographic ways if you want to keep it as a document, I have, because you waste a lot of time to prepare it. So just like prepare it like a table is enough because it can be your template and then you can copy and then enter the information later on, okay, for other data flows because in, in one system, you may have like tens or hundreds or thousands of data flow. If you have to create the um, infographic, it wastes a lot of time indeed. After that, we talk about um, data store. Data store, if you remember, is here. Okay, data store might be text file, might be database. Okay, so it depends on um, what kind of file do you keep this document, it might be the hard copy. So when you would like to um, record or document a data store, okay, the first one you need to just like specify data store name or level. If you say that it is DS1 student database, okay, data store here, you have to specify DS1 colon student underscore db description it is students database okay alternate name if you don't have just leave it as blank or if other people or the users use some other names before you just specify in the alternate name okay attributes attribute means that in this student database what records do we have for example if you say that it consists of student record and consists of what variables for example student id um, student name birth date and so on okay you just specify all of the um, variables that you use in that um, in that record or in that file if you have more than one kind of records specify all other type of records or the detail of the record as well volume and frequency okay this one is quite important as well for example if you say that it's around like um, 500,000 records um, what is the importance of this one because there is a person called database administrator he or she is the one that is used to um, design the database okay so they can tell you that in this database how many megabytes or how many terabytes that this database should be and how large it is how fast will it um, expand for example if you say that okay you have around 500,000 records initially and you say that we have around 5,000 records more per year. So they will calculate the size of your database and what effect, what does it affect to the database admin? The database admin will just like report that, okay, what size, for example, we, we say that we need to have the storage for two terabytes per year, okay? That might be expanding, okay? So that means if we plan to use this system for at least five years, that means just for the student database, the size will be up to 10 terabytes. When it go up to 10 terabytes, what will uh, you are going to do? The things that you have to do is that when we have to just like design the server to keep this kind of data store, 
Okay, we have to think of what we call sizing. Sizing is that when you have to design the size, that is CPU, memory, and okay, storage, and the network that you have to use for your server, what should it be? For the wrong sizing, it causes a problem a lot. Let me give you uh, one example. Um, long time ago, when there was one manufacturing company moved to um, design, decide to just like um, set up their um, branch in Thailand. Okay. Before that, I just like have to let you know that okay, um, in the past, many car manufacturing companies okay, um, they didn't have the uh, what to say they didn't have the company in Thailand. The things that they did was that they had the um, dealer. They call authorized dealer or authorized distributor in Thailand. And also the car was manufactured by another company in Thailand. Okay. Or they may just like import the car from like um, the um, other countries from, for example, they may import the car from Germany, from um, Indonesia, from Malaysia, okay, to Thailand. Okay. So what happened was, that um, car company, I don't tell you the name, okay? Um, that car company would like to just like do their business in Thailand by themselves. They don't want the, the car dealer or the authorized um, distributor to do it because they say that, okay, they want to just like do the marketing plans and do everything and also setting up the factories by themselves because in the past for um, the cars that um, for that brand, okay, they had like two different um, type of car. The one, um, one type is like um, all imported. We call it as CBU car. It's fully imported from other countries. And the other type is CKD or complete knockdown. This is just like assembled in Thailand. But they use like some um, factory to build the car for them okay they would like to change the plan they say that okay they want to have more more ckd or um complete knockdown for their cars to build in in, the, in thailand by themselves so that means they had to just like um, build up their factory in thailand okay and then they did the business in thailand by themselves what happened was okay they hired they hired one um, consulting company okay to design the server and set up the um, system, information system for them. The system is for like um, controlling the manufacturing um, plan and also just like um, checking the stock selling the products for this company. Okay, this kind of system we call it as enterprise system. So they had the enterprise system from, um, from other countries already. This system is what we call SAP or SAP R3 system. At that time, when um, the consulting company planned for SAP R3 for this company, okay, for sure everything was from um, other countries already. So the things that um, Thailand um, branch has to do is that set up a server and installs SAP R3 into this server and let all the, um, what to say, dealers in the factories to link with this server, to link up with this server, and then just do the um, transactions, including the selling, um, including manufacturing with this server. What happened was, at that time, the sizing was done wrongly. The consulting company said that, okay, um, they should buy just only 500 gigabyte of um, hard drive should be enough. That was around like almost 20 years ago. 500 gig was, should be enough, okay, for this company. But because of the wrong sizing, and, and they say that, okay, approximately about three to four, up to five years, that they can use SAP R3 without upgrading the 
without upgrading the hard drive, unfortunately. 500 gigabyte was full in three months after the system start. That was a problem because the system stopped. They couldn't run the system for almost a week. The reason was because when it's full, then um, when the hard drive is full, okay, um, none of the factories, um, computer or the sales department computers can lock them into the system and it was stuck and slow very very slow and finally it must be shut down so you know for these kind of businesses if they stop their business from selling or manufacturing the the car for a day they lost many million bucks so um the things that the company had to do the the consulting company had to do is that they had to rent the server okay from the suppliers to set up for this company immediately. But when they had to use like, or when they had to rent out the, the server from another company, they had to set up the um, system as well that take like one or two days. So that means at least a couple of days, this company had to stop the business operations and also the process. And finally, they had to just like claim the server, the old server that they order to the um, server's company because they say that, okay, um, their customer cannot use um, this server for their business. And they had to buy the server that was bigger. But at that time, if you would like to have like bigger size of the server, you had to just like go to um, order from Singapore. And then they ship from Singapore, it takes around at least two weeks before that, that real server just come to Thailand. So that was a riot when the time goes by, okay? So that's why you need to just like document all of the data stores that you have to keep the information in the system carefully because otherwise, okay, if the sizing is wrong, it will cause a damage, okay, to the company because they can't sell or they can't do the um, business operation. So be careful about this. Volume and frequency is important too. Um, that, but that one is for the big picture, while like others are for programmers and users. If you get or you give the wrong information, programmers may code the program wrongly, or users might just like um, use that um, or interpret the meaning of that data store wrongly. Uh, that is the internal problem. But for the uh, macro problem, it's about like, the sizing of the system that might uh, that may have some problem if you just like do the sizing wrongly. After that, when we have to document the data store, the process must be also to be documented as well. So these are typical characteristics of a process that you have to document. The first one, what is process name and what is the label? If you say that this is process number one, add a course. So when you enter or enter the information of process name or label, you may say that, okay, it's process one, add a course. This is the thing that you have to record in this document. What is the description of add a course? You may say that, okay, a student has to enter to the system. After they log in, they have to go to add a specific course. Um, that is referred to from a, um, a course catalog of that student. Okay? And also they have to specify um, the section that they want to take apart from the course ID, something like that. And process number one, okay, in this example, okay? and you just like um, have the um, process description might be in detail. Okay? Description on the second bullet point is a short description. Okay? And process description um, on the last one is the long description of this process. Okay? You may ask me that, um, can we have just a description but we don't have process description in the long? I can say that maybe or maybe not. Maybe is that if the description is like precise and accurate enough, you don't need to have process description in the long one. But if it's not clear, okay, 
you may just like want other people to have a glance to see at the description but if they have time or if they want to know in detail they have to go and read in the process description to something like that in that case you need to have the process description back up the next one apart from the process what else that we need to have the um, the um, documentation the next one is entity entity that you just like um, put them in the square with the shape or it might be a square only normally it might be a name i'm sorry it might be a person it might be a department or it might be another system uh -huh. so the things that you have to do in order to explain or document the entity is that the first one you must have the entity name suppose you say that okay it is a student entity entity name is a student description is um, might be like okay muic student who are eligible to use this registration system uh -huh. do you have the alternate name or not if you have just enter otherwise you just like put dash no alternate name input data flows means that if there are incoming data flow like this one, okay, what is it? Just put the name of the data flow in here. For example, um, if I say that, okay, you have receipts. Input data flow is receipts. Is receipts. And if you have more than one data flow, that is the input, you have to write down that okay a b c but i mean you don't need to explain what receipt is what a b or c is in the entities documentation because you explained it in the data flow already you just specify the name of input data flow only and what are output data flow for example um, the output data flow it goes to um, let's say payments okay to another process then I'll put data flow in here is payments. Okay. Right, same as the inputs. You don't need to explain the detail of the payments in here because you explained it in um, the payment data flow already. Okay, so when we have the um, recorded the documentation of the entities already, um, the records records of data must be documented as well. So um, characteristic of the record are this. The first one, record or data structure name. What is the record name? For example, you say that, okay, student record equals, and followed by the name, um, the, um, hang on, let me just write it properly. You may write it like this student record equals student id comma name comma um major comma um there's a word and so on this one you also specify the key as well so this one you put them in the record um, format same as you do with the database course or data structure. Just write it down in this form so that when the programmers have a look, they will understand what you mean by this record. Explain the description or definition of this record too. And if you have, if you have um, alternate name, for example, if you say that it exists in some um, process that we may refer to as to rec, Okay, or student info, or stool info, something like that. You just specify the um, alternate names for this record. I have, and attributes means that okay, what are what are like um, the lists or details of this of this record? I have, okay then you just specify that okay there are like student id name major date of birth and so on after that when you document the records already the reports the reports in the system 
okay um we should have the data dictionary report as well normally this kind of data dictionary report will be stored as a folder or as a file um, sometimes in some system they print these kind of reports out and keep in the folder some in some system they generate these reports as the pdf file and keep in the shared drive okay or compile them as a booklet uh, because um, these kind of data dictionary report there are many valuable reports because i mean like later on if you would like to have like the next version of this information system okay or if you would like to have another information system to hook up or to integrate with this system you need to have this report so um, how do we gonna organize this kind of um, valuable reports this kind of reports okay we have to sort them alphabetically it's you have you need to have list of all data elements okay or variables or fields by name This one belong class. Okay, so in this one, um, you have to list all variables or all fields that you have in the, in the whole system. What are um, variables or what are um, fields that you have in the, in the um, whole information system? This kind of report will explain or will describe the data element in the user's department. Uh, which department department that is responsible for data entry of this record uh, that deal with this uh, variables or fields um, anyone or any department who needs to update or who are authorized to delete this record as well uh, you have to just like also indicate that who is responsible for these variables in what responsibilities that um, they have to do so a report of all data flows and data stores that use particular data elements you also have to specify that okay um, these variables or these fields will appear in what data flow what data store so it can be um, seen that you can see back and forth view for the first one when we explain for each data flow we explain for this data element before and we told or we told that we tell the users that okay where okay um, will we use with this um, data element but when we just like generate the list of data element we also just like point back that okay this data element can be found in what data flow the next one detail reports showing all characteristics of data elements records data flows process or any other selected items stored in the data dictionary so all aspect of that data element must be documented because you know um, you will not own that um, piece of data forever you will not be responsible or look at that data forever once the system is launched you have to just like um, port this data or you have to just like keep this documentation to other authorized people or if your company is hired by the um, user's company to develop this system after you just like um, deliver this system to them you have to give the document to them okay because I mean like 
later on they may just like hire some people to responsible or to just like develop the next version of this of this information system นะครับ it might not be you so that's why you have to do the documentation as best as you can นะครับ so that when they just like um, have to use this document once again for the further development okay they will not blame on you นะครับ right and i mean like Suppose they have some problems and they call you back in the next two years. If you don't have the good documentation, you can't answer them what's going on with that system, นะครับ because you forgot about it already. Okay, now let's move on to the next slide. On the next slide, นะครับ um, when we would like to describe the process, นะครับ And you would like to describe the process. Okay. Um, what is the process description to? So you also need to have the document as well to describe the process. Um, a process description document. It documents the detail of functional primitive. Talking about function. What is this process used for? What purpose? That represents specific set of processing steps. And business logic. So in here, it tells us the business process, business logic, and business steps. Um, so when we talk about the process description too, um, in this one, it may be explained by object-oriented development as well. It depends on like how you would like to describe. But if you would like to describe it in the conventional way. You can just explain it as just like bullet points, or you may just like use some other tools, for example, decision um, tree, decision table, in order to explain um, the logic of the process as well. So if you have the modular design, in terms of process description tool, the modular design here is based on combination of three logical structures that um, actually. We we learn in like um, the programming, the basic programming before. Sometimes we may call them as the um, control structures, นะครับ that have like blocks for process. So it consists of three uh, three major things: sequence, นะครับ or everything is in order. Okay, do step one, two, three, four, something like that. Or you have decision making or selection, and the last one is iteration or looping, นะครับ iteration or looping. So these are like three main, three main building blocks that you may see on the modular design. Okay. So, um, in order to explain the process description, you may use what we call structured English. Structured English. In here, okay, the structured English is quite similar to pseudocode. I have is quite similar to pseudocode. Okay. That we um, that we used before, okay. Um, for the structured English that we use, it must conform to the rules. So the first one, we use only um, the three building blocks of sequence selection and iteration only, okay. And then use indentation for readability, similar to like the bullet point like this. You may use bullet point to help as well, นะครับ. Or you may use the numbering to help for the sequence, นะครับ. And then um, we try to use a limited vocab, okay, including standard terms that used in data dictionary and specific words that describe processing rules. For example, if we say that okay, we have to check student ID, okay, and we say that in the data dictionary of the student ID is student underscore ID, then when you have Mention student ID in um, structured English. You have to use this form student underscore ID like this, because okay, if you just use stu ID like this, other people don't understand what it means. นะครับ Then you have to use the same word student underscore ID is student underscore ID, not even student space ID here, because it might be different thing. It might be different thing from uh, what it should be. So um, this is the thing that we have to do for the limited um, vocab that we have to use. After that,
when we just like um, use a structured English, นะครับ it might look familiar to programming um, students because it resembles pseudo code. Yeah, primary purpose of structured English to to describe underlying business logic. So you can see that we use indentation like this. Okay, as a pseudo code that we learned before. Uh, for example, in here, this is decision making um, consists of like nested if. Uh, so we use indentation to know that we have levels, different levels of if, uh, and also else as well for making decision in different um, different things. Uh, this is sales promotion policy. Uh, when we use structured English to represent, it should look like this. So that means every time that you have to just like um, prepare a process. For example, if you say that process number one, it's student, I'm um, sorry, process number one is add a course. So when you just like document add a course process, you have to explain that, okay, what um, add a course process do by just like using a structured English like this to explain a pseudo code. So in this case, you can see that um, because this is the anal analysis part, uh, and when you um, and you start just the design part, not the implementation part yet. Once you design this structured English, this one will be passed to the programmers. Once programmer, I mean, just just like you just think, if you were the programmer and then you see the structured English like this, you can code the program easily because you know the logic of this program, what they are going to do. And um, as I told you, if they use the word customer, that means the word customer must be found that, okay, it is a record somewhere um, in the data floor or in the data store, or it is the entity, something like that. So the programmer will know how to gonna manage um, or code this program for um, sales promotion policy, okay, or student um, registration system as um, I mentioned earlier. Okay, so when we have this already, apart from um, structured English, we may use another tool that is called decision tables. Decision tables will be used to show the logical structures of the system, or of the process, with our possible combinations of com um, conditions and also resulting actions that may occur. And also, this is important to consider every possible outcome to ensure that you have overlooked nothing. So in this example, you can see that they said that, okay, they have like choices one, two, three, four, and um, just like have the uh, statement to check. Credit status is checked, um, is okay for condition one, two, three, four. Okay, and then just put yes or no or something like that. Okay, so this one, somebody just used the decision table as a part to explain the structured English that you had before. Uh -huh. Because normally, um, for the decision tables, it's just used to make a decision only in the decision-making part. But for the sequence or for the iteration, the decision table cannot tell you. So that means you may have to combine the technique of structured English with decision table. Uh -huh. And um, something that you have to know about decision tables is that the first one, if you have number of rules, okay, in the decision table, it will be number, the, the number of rules will be doubled every time that you add a condition. Uh -huh. And you can have more than two possible outcomes, okay. Often are the best way to describe complex set of conditions. So that means if you use structured English, in terms of sequence and iteration, um, it, um, structured English uh, is good. But if you have complex set of conditions, once you use structured English, it might be too detailed to write down in many sentences or in many levels. Then you may use decision table to help instead. Uh -huh. okay. After that, you may use decision trees to help as well. Decision tree is another tool this one, you can see that it just like try to visualize the picture of the decision making in, um, in terms of decision trees, sorry, in terms of 
yeah, the decision making in terms of decision trees, instead of using decision table or instead of using structured English. This one looks similar to the flowchart that we have, but it just contains a part of decision making only. For example, in here, um, you would like to check for, uh, for the coupon that you will give to the customer. So the first one, okay, the condition is that you check whether that person is a preferred customer or not. If no, just give 5% bonus coupon. If yes, is, um, if that person is preferred customer, you, um, you also have to continue checking whether the order is more than $1,000 or not. If yes, sorry, if no, okay, it means that that person is a preferred customer, but the purchasing is less than, is not more than 1,000, I have to give 25% bonus coupon. But if the order is more than 1,000, you also have to check again whether they use the chart card or not. If no, we give 5% discount. If yes, 5% discount and additional 5% discount. I have. So this one okay, is the way in order to explain as the additional tools okay, from just the decision table and from just the um, um, structured English as well. So that means if you have like the complex decision making, decision tree is also help okay, apart from decision table because sometimes the decision table looks flat and it's quite difficult to user to understand. But the decision tree here, it looks like a tree and it branch out into like um, all possible reasons to support all, all possible choices and all possible decisions that they have to make. Okay. So decision trees um, is also another good tool as well. So, which tool to use? It depends on the project. It depends on the complex of the logic that you have as well. Um, some of you may ask me that, is it possible to use just the structured English? I can tell you that, yes, you may. But um, you have to make sure that um, the structured English for your information system um, can be used to explain enough detail for the complex decision making. If it's too detailed, my suggestion is that you may have to just like use decision tree or decision table to help as well. Okay. So if decision trees or decision um, tables, which one is better? Um, for myself, I prefer decision tree uh, because decision table sometimes is just like quite difficult to just like generate all the possible values in the same table. Okay. okay. So the next thing that you have to know is that when we talk about the tools that you have to use in order to explain the logic of the process already. Okay. Now we talk about different type of model that we have. Okay. When we just like have to draw the diagram and prepare the, um, the tools in order to explain the logic of the information system, okay. There are two different types of models that you also have to understand. One is called logical model. The other one is physical model. So what are they? And which one do you have to do? So in this one, um, the explanation is that when you um, use the structured analysis tool to develop logical model for a new information system already, the tool can also develop um, physical model of information system too. Now let me explain to you first. When you prepare a set of um, data flow diagrams, okay, normally you develop for the logical one first, okay, the logical model first. The logical models means that, okay, which department has to use this system and how do they gonna use it, okay, logically. But in terms of physical model, it's just like a more detail. We develop later after we finish developing the logical model already. So for the, for the um, physical model, this model, okay, including the diagrams or the diagrams that you have, this model used to show how system requirements are implemented. For example, it include programming language, it include all the objects that you have, it include all variables you have, 
And also, instead of writing down as a pseudo code, you may use a part of the um, programming language, the code in the programming language you type in straight away. You may have to talk about like physical kind of like um, database that you have to use. For example, what is the name of the database? What is the name of the connection? Okay, how many bytes you have to reserve? And what data structure that you have to use to, um, to store the data, for example? Um, in the physical model, you may just like explain for the linked list, while the logical model, we don't talk about linked list at all. We say that, okay, this is the um, structure of the records that you store the data, just that. So that means uh, for logical models, as you are system analysts, you will use this logical model to communicate with your users, while physical model, as you are the system analyst, you use a physical model to communicate with programmers. So that's why system analyst is the one, is this the person who just like uh, be the inter, um, intermediary or the middle person to communicate between business people and technical people. After that, when we talk about the, uh, the model, okay, um, we also have like sequence of model to be considered as well. Okay. We found that in many information system, um, in many information system, many of SA or many of system analysts, they create a model of current system. Create a physical model of current system first. After that, they develop logical model of current system. And then they just like tackling a logical model of the new system. So it will be like this. They have as is physical model. After that, they develop as is logical model. And after that, they develop to be logical model. And um, sometimes um, the system analyst may stop at to be logical model and pass this one to the programmers. Okay? Because programmers, when they see this kind of like documents, they um, understand in most of the part of the to be logical model. But some of the info, um, some of the system analysts, they after they develop the to be logical model, they also develop the to be physical model as the last one. Because this one, the programmer will understand clearly about the, um, the, the things that they need to have in the new system. Okay. So the sequence will be like this. Start from as is physical model, followed by as is logical model, followed by to be logical model, and maybe optional, end up with the to be physical model, okay. like this one. Okay, so when we finish this one already, okay, we said that, okay, um, but anyway, it's performing extra steps, okay, that allows them to understand current system better. You can see that in here, um, the system analyst has to do the as is physical and as is logical here, okay, it takes some time, so then they understand well for the information system that they have. After that, you can see that they have like some time when they just like draw the as is physical model and as is logical model already. Um, it takes some time so that they will understand what to be drawn for the to be logical model and to be physical model finally. So in here, we may have to understand the full model approach as well that I draw it in the previous slide before. We develop physical model of current system or as is physical model. Then we do as is logical model. As is, after you finish as is logical model already, you create to be um, logical model and finally we end up with the to be physical model in four 
um, in four different models altogether. Okay. But anyway, if you have to draw four, um, four models altogether, from the first one, that is physical model of the current, until, um, the current system, until the last one, physical model of the new system, it takes time. And it, um, it, take, um, it has the cost as well. For time, you may understand, okay, we spend the time to draw all of this, but what about the cost? The time is the cost. So because of what? If you are a system analyst, every day that you work, every minute that you work, the company has to pay for you. That means it's a cost of the company. The more the users want, the more money that your company has to pay on you for your salary. If it is okay um, for the company, okay, that is, that is okay if, if you want, I mean, if they want you to just like um, draw this kind of four model to the customer, okay, it, it's okay if you just like, if your boss say that, okay, you better develop this kind of models for them. But in some company, they say that, okay, the shortcut that they may do is that, they develop logical model of the SE system. And after that, they develop logical model of the new system and then just develop the physical model of the new system. Okay, so that means they save one step. Okay, because the current model of the uh, physical model of SE, they may not develop it. Okay, somebody has more shortcut. If the system analysts and the programmers are the same group of people, they may develop just logical model of current system and logical model of new system and that's it. Right. So it depends on your company and your customer company because I mean like um, they might want to have like everything including physical model of like um, old system and new system as well. So you have to just like um, prepare for them. So this is the data dictionary that you have to do after you finish all the data flow diagrams already. Okay. So up to this point, do you have any questions for um, this module? So just to add you a little more, um, for data dictionary of each document okay, or each component in the data flow diagrams that you have to do, I told you that it's a free form, okay? Um, you, can, you may be able to use this idea that I just like show you the one that with a picture, like this, okay? You may use like this kind of table as an example, okay? or you may Google to find out just like some example of data dictionaries that um, people use nowadays, or some company. You have to know that, okay, this one, if you have to design the template for this kind of, of um, documentation, who is suitable for designing this kind of thing? If you are running your own company, for sure, all of the documentation you have to design your own with your own template. Okay. So you have to design by yourself. And then you have, um, you may have a look from Google to see like um, the popular kind of like documentation that they do for this kind of like um, diagrams, okay? Um, my suggestion is that um, you should use the company-wide template. That means if you have the template already, use it for every single team that you have in your company so that everyone will know the same standard. And if that person just like roll out from the team already, and go to join another team in the future. They still know that, they still understand the standard that the company use, including the standard template of the PowerPoint as well. If you set up your own company, you should set up the standard of the template for the PowerPoint so that when everyone try to just like, uh, when everyone try to just like present the work to the customer, all of us use the same template. This is the way that you should do it. Apart from that one, okay, if you are working for a specific consulting company or software house, they may have their standard template for documentation or for um, some presentation already. 
ask your seniors about this because our, or your supervisor because they know that okay we have to use this one otherwise if you don't ask them and you finish your work already later on if um, you have to present it to the customer um, they may ask you to just like change to use the standard template instead so just ask them first that these are like the the standard document that we have to use okay so that's all for module number four that is data and processing more um, and process modules and, and process modeling that you have to just like um, do the do the documentation for this including the diagram including the um, the documents in terms of like the um, tables in terms of just like um, uh, what to say data dictionary okay if you don't have any questions I have um, the case for this module I'll just like it is the data flow diagrams case I'll just like um, raise it up as the um, in the workshop instead um, so I'll just like I will open that um, uh, case study for you uh, tonight so that you can just have a look first but we will do it together on this Saturday also the term project assignment uh, I will also just like um, post it on tonight as well so that you can have a look but I think you better just like spend the time for the term examination first uh, um, you don't need to just like do the term project assignment now just wait because I mean at least on Saturday if you still have some time to do you may be able to do it and ask me um, is it um, for any modification or for some parts whether it's correct or not okay so um, now if there is no question about this model this module sorry I'd like you to download another module in um, from canvas so I can tell you that in the midterm examination, it will be the case studies only. Okay, um, for the case studies, okay, they are um, about module one to module four. Okay? I start module five first, but because I haven't finished module number five, so um, um, in the examination, it does not include module number five content. Okay? It will include just module one to four only. So um, I get the question okay, from some of you asking about grading criteria of the exam. Normally, um, for, the, for, the, for the case studies, actually, most of the time, there is no right or wrong. I give you actually um, quite good score for the, for, the, um, for the case studies in the exam. But the things that I just like uh, make you have like to judge you whether you better get the um, better um, score than other people is that I will check for your creativity, for your opinion, for your suggestion. If you just like, if I ask what is, um, for example, suppose I say that, okay, if you remember the case study that we had before, for example, um, the hotel. That would uh, that would like to adopt the system from the um, from the main um, company or the main hotel or should use the local um, local information system and you said I think that you use local system and then you finish the question that one I may give you the score but it's not full because I will have to ask you that okay if you think that. Um, the um, the local system should be used. How can this system be implemented? You may say that okay, I suggest that they should do this. They should customize um, the main system to match with this one. Um, that one you get a lot of score because you propose your ideas. Okay, so that means the tips for answering the exam question is that explain, not just answer, because actually. Um, the question that they ask you in the exam is to frame you, okay, to be the point that I want you to not to go outside this frame. Uh -huh. But I mean, like when you explain, 
you just explain anything that you eat that is your idea I don't want you to think in the box you can think outside the box นะครับ but anyway it not be outside the frame that is about like um, system um, development and design นะครับ just like um, try to just like use the ideas that we obtain from the class and also the experience that you have นะครับ um, especially for the one who just like has has the experience in just like um, Writing the programs as your freelance, or you just like do some freelance work, some internship. That would be good. Just put all of your experience into the answer, then you get the very high score. Okay, that is the way that I just want to tell you. So for anyone who asks me in the chat box, um, does um, do I answer your question for this one? If it's yes, please let me know. Okay, um, right. Okay, and I have so um, you may type any question to ask me. Um, please open up the module number five. Let me start a bit before we finish the class today. Um, module number five. It's about object modeling. Okay, I can tell you that actually I am the DFD guy. Okay, I don't go to the To the object modeling much, okay. So, but anyway, I have to explain to you four other things that we need to know as well. I have everyone. Okay. Okay. This one. In this in this module, นะครับ um, how many case studies or question will you give us for the exam? It will be around three cases, ครับ The cases will not be long. Okay, we can answer for exam in words and send you as a pad, a PDF for the answer. Yes, ครับ In the PDF, ครับ um, I don't want Google Form because some of Some of the people, um, I mean, like, what to say? I prefer. I think I prefer. I prefer the PDF file better. นะครับ So what we are going to do? The thing is that um, I will just like give you the examination um file as the PDF to you on Canvas. นะครับ So when I give you the exam paper already, okay, you just download it, and then you just you just use Word document. นะครับ Um, to answer to me, so for the DFT that you have to draw or um, context diagram that you have to draw, um, if you use iPad, you may draw it on iPad and send that file to me. Or if you don't have it and you have just a laptop, the things that I just suggest you to do is that you may just like use the um, or to say a piece of paper and pencil to draw and take a photo and give it to me. Okay. How much is expected to answer for each case study? นะครับ um, Actually, it depends. Have I can't tell you, but I mean, like, it shouldn't be just like one sentence for each question. No, because if I say that, okay, explain. That means it should be more. It might be a paragraph. Let's say 200 words, 300 words, something like that. นะครับ More than more than just like one short sentence, or more than just yes or no. Time you have for midterm is one hour 15 minutes. Okay. Do we have to draw the for like for the every case or not? No, You just like have a question for the for diagram only, but the rest of the question I'll ask you for um, answering the question same as we did in the case regular case study. Just one question only to draw the data flow diagrams. Because I know that it takes time to draw the data flow diagram in the exam room, so that's why I just like ask you to draw the data flow diagram in our case studies and also in your term project only. Right. Open cam, yes, ครับ. You have to, นะครับ. It's a regulation for for our subject. Data dig, no, ครับ. You don't have the time to do so because data dictionary. It's just like if I ask you to just like 
write the data dictionary for the data flow diagrams that you draw, at least you may have to spend half a day to finish it. You don't need to do so. For data dictionary, I just like teach you to let you know what do we need to have only. At most, if I ask you, I may ask you that, okay, um, right, um, in this case, okay, what data dictionary is missing or uh, what data dictionary should be added, something like that. Uh -huh. But you don't need to just like list all of the data dictionary in the table. No, I don't do like that. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. Okay, then I'll just like start um, handout or module number five. Uh -huh. So if you still have any questions, just ask me. Uh -huh. So in this, um, in this module, it's object modeling. Uh -huh. So um, some of you may learn about object-oriented programming already. Uh -huh. um, actually, it's just another, another way to view and model the system requirements from then the data flow diagram that we studied from the previous module. Uh -huh. So in this module, we can use object-oriented methods uh -huh. um, to document, to analyze, and to model information system. Uh -huh. um, Object-oriented or OO analysis. In here, I just like have a short recap for the OO a little bit. Uh, when we talk about object-oriented analysis, we also need to talk about, or we also need to know about the object too. Uh, object-oriented, uh, it's also a popular, um, another popular approach. This approach sees the system from the viewpoint of object themselves uh, as a, an object as functions and interaction, uh -huh. and then we just like have the object model. But in some businesses, if you have to use the object oriented, it might be difficult for um, your, your users, uh -huh. especially if you have to use like some kind of agile methods that you need to let the users understand everything with you at the same time. Uh -huh. It might be the problem because um, they may not understand how to create the object. Uh -huh. Okay, so when we talk about object oriented, uh -huh, we have terms and concepts that we have to understand. Um, in this one, we will use the UML or Unified Modeling Language to explain. Uh -huh. We have attributes, methods, message, class, and instance. This one I'll explain to you next on. Uh -huh. So let's see. In this one, okay, when we talk about the interaction between objects, uh -huh, suppose we are talking about car, a car as an object. Uh -huh. um, talking about the left-hand side here, it's the attributes, attributes of the car object. We said that the car object has characteristics uh -huh, of the car. Uh -huh. uh, we call it as attributes. What are attributes of the car object? such as make uh, or brand, uh, model of the car, color of the car, uh, or type of the car, for example, sedan, um, or station wagon, or cabriolet, uh, or pick up. Uh, those are like attributes of the car. While messages, uh, messages, the driver object uh, sends message to car object, such as, um, the driver just like clean the windshield or slow down or break the car. Uh -huh. These are the message that the driver sent to the car. Uh -huh. And the method, uh -huh. operate wipers, apply brakes, change the gear. Uh -huh. These are methods that um, the car can have. Uh -huh. Okay. So when we have like these kind of the objects, the car objects, the um, driver object already, we have attributes of the car, okay? We have message that can be sent from one to another, from one object to another object. We have method or the operations that that object can be done. Uh, in this one, if we are talking about the object, uh, we have parent object, Parent object is the object that consists of, it's just like a template. Um, 
for the parent or for the object like this. Okay, this is a parent object. For example, in here we have attributes, we have methods of the object. For example, okay, um, when we talk about a person, you can see that a person has name, has age, has sex, has hair color, as as a person's um, object. Um, the character um, characteristic that describe parent objects can be displayed as the attributes. While object, a parent object has a method as well. For example, for the parent object, a parent object means like parent your your um, father or mother. Okay, that is a parent. Okay, method that um, the parent object can do. Methods are the tasks that parent object can perform. Our parents can read bedtime story, can drive in the carpool. So now, when we talk about instance of the parent object, like Mary Smith, okay, this is the name of parent okay, as a parent object. The age, 25, sex is female, hair color is red, Ahmed Al, Ahmed Ali, sorry, age, 36, Sex is male, hair color is brown, and Anthony Green, okay, age is 42, gender is male, sex is male, and hair color is brown. So that means when we have the parent object here, um, the instance, okay, or the example in of the in of the parent object are here, here. And I mean like in terms of just like object-oriented analysis when we just like would like to represent one thing for example if we are talking about receipts a receipt that um let's say sales department issue the receipt to their customer a receipt can be an object as well okay and when we talk instead of a receipt it might be receipt number one two three okay and contain the information inside that is instead of the parent object The next one, when we talk about child object, child object also has attributes and method as well. For example, child, child object has attribute like name, age, sex, hair number, hair color, sorry, and number of siblings. While methods, for child object has pick up toys, eat dinner, play, cooperate, and get ready for bed. So example of the child object, Maybe like James Smith, he is three years old. What is his age? Sex is male, hair color is red. In this one, it doesn't tell number of siblings because this child that might not have any siblings in here. So this is another object that we have. The next one, dog object. The similar things. Um, the object must have attributes and the method. And when we just like um, have the instance of that object, it's just a specific, um, spe specific object of that thing. For example, buddy is a specific um, dog for the dog object and also it has the properties, sorry, it has the attributes in here. Okay, same as Annie and Megan, okay, they are dogs as well. Okay. And for the object, like um, student object and instructor object, you can see that for its students, we have attributes, instructor, um, we have attributes for the instructor too, and we have different methods. Okay, even we say that, but um, students and instructors, they are human beings. You can see that, but this one, you can see that uh, because they are in different roles. Okay, student is the role student. That human being is a student. So the um, attributes and methods might be different from um, the instructors that we have. I have. And what are attributes? Okay. So if the objects are similar to noun, attributes are similar to adjective that is that are used to describe that noun, describe the characteristic of that noun, okay, or that object. Some object may have few attributes, other may have lots of attributes, and each um, attribute has state too, okay, or have different values too. The next thing that you have to know is method. Uh, a method 
for an object define specific tasks that an object can perform just as objects are similar to nouns and attributes are similar to adjective methods resemble verbs that describe what and how an object does something for example methods in this example is method more fries when you see method more fries the steps in more fries means to heat oil and then fill um fill fry basket with frozen potato strips lower basket into hot oil check for readiness when ready rest basket and let drain pour fries into warming tray warming tray sorry and then add salt okay this is the step in the process more fries it explain and describe what and how an object does something in this one okay for the message okay when we specify the message um, for an object message in here for example um, the message good night okay when um, parent object receive message good night dog receive message good night and child um, receive message good night what will happen cause the parent for the parent when they receive message good night cause the parent object to read bedtime story for dog if dog receive good night message it cause the dog object to go to sleep and for child mess about child object when they receive good night message it causes the child object to get ready for bed okay. so it can be different when different um, when different object receive the same message they can do everything differently okay. and for the uh, for the messages okay, we have like different terms to be used with messages polymorphism black box and encapsulation that i'll explain to you in detail more okay, for the message that each that each um, object received okay. for the message okay, a major advantage of object oriented design when we have messages is that um, system analysts can save the time and avoid error by using modular object okay. programmers can translate the design into the design into their um, code okay. working with re reusable program modules that have been tested and verified so that means in terms of programmers they save the time okay. in terms of system analysts they can avoid errors because they can try to just like use the object that can be re reused okay. for example like um instructor um for the message they send integrate to the student worker okay. so that means it will explain um something details in the object that you just like when you create um, and when message has been passed to the student record what will it be um, okay another term that we use in object oriented is classes okay, or class an object belongs to a group or a category we call it as class okay. and we say that object or object within a class to share common attributes and methods okay. and we also have the term called subclasses and superclasses as well okay. that i show you in the details next on okay. for example when we talk about a class vehicle okay. um, if we talk about class vehicle it consists of attributes okay, that are make model year weight color and methods are stop stop path okay. these are just like um, the class that we have but for the subclass, you can see that the car, okay, is a subclass of vehicle. Okay. Um, it has attributes, same as um, the vehicle class that we have as well. Okay. Minivan is a subclass of the car, oh, sorry, of the vehicle as well. Truck is a subclass of the vehicle as well. Or even boat okay, or yacht is a subclass of the vehicle as well. Okay. but you can see that the truck which is a subclass of vehicle the attributes load limit is a spatial attribute that can be found in the subclass truck only the load limit is not found in the vehicle class and also is not found in car or minivan um, class as well okay. because the subclass can also have its spatial attributes than the regular class or superclass that they have, 
that they belong to, and also they can have like um, different attributes than other subclass in the same level as well. For this one, for the class, when we talk about relationship among objects and class, what are they? Okay. Uh, we can have the properties of inheritance, child, and parents. You can see that, okay, uh, when we talk about parent, object, and child, uh, you can see that for the, for the parent object like employee, okay, instructor, uh, instructor is employee, uh, and we have the methods that can be inherited from the parent, from the parent object, uh, because I mean like, you know, that instructor actually, oh, instructor, are employees of MUIC, let's say. So in this one, um, apart from type of instructors, the rest of attributes from the employee object I inherited from the employee object because um, all the, the attributes like social security number, telephone number, higher their title and period are all from the employee um, class or, or employee object. While methods, Methods can be um, seen that get hired, terminate, change telephone. Okay, this one I inherited from employee object as well because um, the instructor is an employee. Uh -huh. So you can see that in this case, uh -huh, um, parent is, is employee, uh -huh, while child object is, uh, in this case, is instructor uh -huh, and it inherits the properties such as attributes and methods uh, from parent to child. Right. Okay, so for uh, today's time, I just like explain about like the basic terminology that we have to use in, in the um, object-oriented um, analysis and design that we have to use already, okay? On the next class that will be on next Thursday, I will talk about more on the diagram, the, like the object or in, um, object relationship diagram that we have to use um, to understand for the object oriented analysis and design. Okay, so um, on this coming Saturday, as I mentioned earlier, we are going to have the um, workshop for data flow diagrams. Um, so um, if possible, I recommend all of you to be together. We will work as a team, as a team that will do the, will do the, the term project. Um, apart from that one, let me just like talk about the midterm exam a bit more. Okay. Um, for the midterm examination, we will have around like three different cases for you to do. One question will be dedicated to data flow diagrams. The other two questions will be just like answer the question same as the case study that you did before and give the opinion and suggest of like um, doing um, analysis and a little bit design part because um, in the case um, when I just explain the business case in your exam it might be it might look good it might sound good but I will just ask you that okay how can you improve it what part is missing or what is the um, um, drawback of having this system? What should we do? Something like that. Nah um, now in the midterm exam, we just like go to the part of analysis only. Nah um, the design part, nah especially for the interaction design for the interface or input output will be on final exam instead. Now we are still in the analysis part. Nah so we have two hours, around two hours. Actually, it's one hour, 15 minutes uh, um, as our, our regular class time from 10 to 11.50, uh, 10 to 11.50. We use um, PDF file. You submit me through PDF file on Canvas. Uh, um, and if you draw anything, you may just like use um, a, pen, a paper and pencil to draw and take a photo, submit to me, but you have to make sure that it must be clearly. Uh, um, Nailin Cup, it should it focus on SA. Yes, cup system analysis cup in this part. Because otherwise, if you analyze 
um, the system not good enough, you can't design um, it well in the um, design part. Uh, design part we haven't started yet. Uh, design part will be after midterm exam. Uh, okay. So up to this point, everyone, do you have any questions? Uh, uh, when will if the workshop be conducted? It will be conducted this Saturday, na kap, twelve o'clock to two o'clock, twelve o'clock to two o'clock, na kap. I would just like announce you on um on what to say, um our line group, na kap. Again, actually it's twelve to two, as I told you earlier, na kap. So we conduct through um Zoom, na kap, as usual, and I'll break you into the small group. So that you can work um, for the case of module four, and then we just like do the uh, module. Sorry, we will do the term project work as well during the workshop time, because the next um, assignment for the term project is to what to say is to draw the data flow diagrams for your information system. Okay, then everyone. If you don't have any questions, นะครับ for the rest of video lecture, yes, sure, ครับ I'm um what to say? I just like try to um render the video as as soon as I can because it takes a lot of time. Now I can just like um finish two more videos after lecture five, นะครับ so I think during this weekend I can just like do the rest of them. I try to just like do everything before, before, before Sunday, so that you can have time to just like see everything. นะครับ Okay then, ครับ everyone before we finish the class, นะครับ um please um turn on your camera, นะครับ and also for uh, more questions, นะครับ just feel free to ask me in the chat room. Ah, uh, sure. I just see your dad half an hour ago. We will have the meeting together. Okay, now run, Kap, and Sahasawat, please turn on your camera, Kap. Bariwat, too. Bariwat. Bariwat, I don't see you yet, Kap. Bariwat and Naran. So while you are having the midterm exam, everyone has to turn on your camera all the time while you are here. And if you have to just like go to the restroom, just let me know first. Right, Pariwat, I haven't seen you yet. Are you still here? Mr. Pariwat Huang. Okay, I think he might be to the restroom. That doesn't matter. Okay, everyone, see you on Saturday. We just like meet each other on on um, Zoom, the regular room that we use for um, the regular lecture. นะครับ Okay, then everyone we have a nice day and we see each other again on this coming Saturday. นะครับ um, Pretty, you can access materials. ครับ It's open book, no problem. นะครับ Bye bye everyone. Have a good one. Bye bye. Take care and thank you. นะครับ You're welcome. Have a good day, Kappa Jan. You too, Kappa Ritin. Bye bye. Yeah, Kapp. Yes, sure. I'll try to post it by Saturday. So I'll do my homework tonight. I have to render all the videos. Bye bye, everyone. Take care.